Hi, good morning. I'm Diana Glyer, and I'm excited to meet with you today and to talk with you a little bit about Lewis, Tolkien, and the Inklings, and to, I hope, shed some light on the nature of their dynamic interaction and the influence that they had on one another's work. This uh, talk is being uh, put together at the request of the faculty at North Wind Seminary in honor of the inaugural class of PhD students who are studying their new program in Romantic Theology. What a wonderful program, what a wonderful opportunity, uh, and what an what a honor to be part of, uh, of this uh, new class and this new thing that God is doing. So welcome. If by chance you've stumbled across this video or are overhearing this talk in another way from another direction, uh, I want you to know that you are also welcome. I'm glad you're here and I'm glad for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my book, The Company They Keep. So a couple of things that may be helpful to just set uh, the tone here. This is not a formal lecture as much as it is an invitation to my class uh, where I have a chance to talk about it. I also want to let you know that I'll be focusing more on issues related to methodology than the conclusions that were revealed by that method. Here, here's the reason for it. As new students embarking on this in-depth study of some of the most exciting authors and most important great, great works, uh, you're going to be looking for literary influence. You're going to be doing literary analysis. And what I hope uh, I can do is not just summarize some of the key ideas in the company they keep, but invite you into an investigative process and to challenge you in the kind of research and reading and writing that you will ultimately be doing, not only as you complete this PhD program, but as you continue to work as a scholar, as a thinker and a writer, as a student for the rest of your life. So let me uh, share my screen and get us to our PowerPoint for today. The title of my talk is C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien and the Inklings, what I am calling an inside view. What do I mean by that? Well, we're really blessed these days because there are quite a number of books that address the Inklings and describe the nuts and bolts, the foundational content that's so important to know about these members of this writing group. Uh, we are, uh, we have no problem at all trying to find the answers to kind of the basic overview types of questions. We uh, have information about who the participants were. We know that there were 19 men who were part of this regular meeting. Uh, we know that they were close friends, that they were colleagues at university, but also that many of them were friends from their undergraduate days. We know that they uh, met twice a week on Tuesdays for a more informal and open meeting at the Eagle and Child Pub. These meetings included students often who would drop by and uh, join them there at the pub. Uh, women were part of that conversation. The Tuesday meetings were not marked by the analysis of manuscripts or the sharing of drafts, but rather that was an open conversation it was still very important to their writing though because it was an opportunity for them to examine the underlying concepts and the fundamental ideas that sparked their imagination. So those conversations were key, but manuscripts were not read and critiqued at that Tuesday meeting. On Thursdays, by invitation only, a smaller group of individuals would meet, usually at Lewis's rooms at Maudlin College in Oxford, and usually fairly late at night. The Inklings met after dinner, which to me would be 6.30 or 7, but to them was about 9 o'clock. So they were late night kind of people as they got together. And those meetings were critique times. They would pull out manuscripts, they would read, uh, those drafts in progress, those very, very rough, rough drafts, and then the group would critique every aspect of it, big matters and small matters, and they would talk late into the night about the things that they were working on. That's the overview of the nature of the group we know as the Inklings. But when I discovered that Lewis and Tolkien were friends, and I discovered the existence of this writer's circle, I wanted to know more. 
I wasn't content with the outside view. I, I was really curious to have an inside view. You know, I wanted to be like at a table at the Eagle and Child pub, kind of overhearing that rich conversation, these, these geniuses, these, these creative individuals. What in the world would it have been like to just sit and listen to them as they interacted? I can't imagine anything better than that rich conversation, that wild interaction that they had with each other. And because I'm interested in the creative process specifically, I wanted to know something else. Taking an inside view, I wanted to know specifically what difference did it make, these wonderful conversations, these profound friendships, what difference did it make to the books that they were writing? As I express it in the company they keep, here were the questions I was most eager to answer. What difference did it make that Lewis, Tolkien, Williams, and the other Inklings wrote in association with one another? What comments, suggestions, connections, ideas, or criticisms did they share with one another? What part did encouragement and criticism play in the completion of their texts? How did their relationship affect the amount of material that each man produced? Were there any joint projects? What impact did they have on the reception of each other's work by those outside their circle? As these questions suggest, my interest in the Inklings was really kind of the full range of that creative process from the first spark of a new idea to the actual production of text and the encouragement and persistence of that over time to the sharing of that work with others to connect the work and the author to the larger circle of readers and critics and others who might be interested in that work. A full range, a full network of interaction. In order to find the answer to those two questions, at the time that I began researching, the primary text for that was a book called The Inklings by Humphrey Carpenter, a brilliantly written book. But I was discouraged to discover that not only does Humphrey Carpenter not give us an inside view of the interaction of the Inklings, he denies that there was, in fact, any, any influence among uh, the members of that group. And so here from Humphrey Carpenter, he says, the word influence, so beloved of literary investigators, makes little sense when talking about their association with each other. Tolkien and Williams owed almost nothing to the other inklings and would have written everything they wrote had they never heard of the group. I was uh, surprised, flabbergasted, and uh, to be honest, kind of discouraged when I came across uh, this declaration. And I thought, well, maybe Carpenter's just missing something. And maybe some of the other scholars who are looking at these authors have a more robust view of their creative interaction and the influence that must have flow, uh, flowed from their uh, me regular meetings and their times together. So I looked at Gareth Knight, who's written several books about the Inklings, and he said, we have to be careful, however, not to attribute influence where none existed. Okay, I kept digging, came across Lynn Carter, a critic and scholar who looks at uh, both fantasy and science fiction work. And he writes, whatever criticism the Inklings offered, Tolkien paid no, no attention. The Inklings were unable to influence the writing of the Lord of the Rings in any way. And then in a sweeping statement, a kind of summary of what scholarship was asserting at the time, Lynn Carter adds, everyone concerned seems quite adamant on that point. Well, okay, all the scholars seem quite adamant on this point, but what about the Inklings themselves? I looked at uh, the statements of Tolkien about his writing process and he said, you know, I don't think we had any influence on each other. Too set and too different. 
I dug a little deeper and came across what is uh, in most circles considered the last word on influence among the inklings. And that's this declaration from C.S. Lewis. No one ever influenced Tolkien. You might as well try to influence a bandersnatch. When I started working on the research that became the company they keep, I was daunted by this overwhelming mountain of evidence that uh, influence was something that we could not see, we would not find, we could not track, or we could not trace. Uh, to make matters worse, not only were the scholars in unison, not only did I find statements by the Inklings denying influence, but the man who was at the time my scholarly mentor, uh, a faculty member, a teacher, uh, someone who became, had become a dear friend and helper in the work that I was doing, took me aside and said, you know, maybe there was influence, maybe there wasn't, but you're never going to find the concrete, um, reliable evidence of whatever interaction they had. Uh, I was discouraged, but I decided to take a shift to make a change in the way that I examined and researched these authors. This is the cover of the first edition of the company they keep, the hardcover edition. And the person who designed this cover built in a clue that I think is the key to what uh, this book has to offer. What is it that I'm trying to accomplish in the company they keep? And how might it offer something that's a little different from the overview that we see in other scholarly treatments of the group? That little circle there, pulling off of the idea of the typewriter is actually a shift key. Uh, a shift key that's part of an old typewriter suggests here a paradigm shift a paradigm shift to a bigger picture, a different point of view, a different perspective of the inklings, maybe a different way of looking at influence and for influence. So if we're searching for influence, what is it exactly that we're looking for? And what is it we're looking at? So here's the shift that I think is characteristic or that summarizes what I'm trying to accomplish in the company they keep. That instead of looking at the finished product for evidence of influence, I'm looking at the interactive process. Here's what I mean. If you're looking to see uh, whether or not uh, two authors have influenced each other, let's say that you're looking to see if in any way Tolkien's uh, work, The Hobbit, has had an influence on Lewis's work, um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. What you might do then is take those two books and look at the pages of the, those books and look to see what uh, you might find by examining that published product. That is a great way to consider influence. The problem is it doesn't account for all of the things that happen when two authors or two artists or two painters or two musicians, uh, two filmmakers, when they know each other personally, when they are colleagues and friends, and when they are intimately involved in one another's active creative process throughout the stages of that process. So, the first shift that I think is important methodologically is that we can't limit evidence of influence to just the published product. We have to also look at the process that's involved. Well, if we're not going to look at just the product, but the process, what are we going to look for? Traditionally, studies of influence look for similarity or imitation. They see the same thing. Uh, the presence of a lion in both Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and the place of the lion uh, it, by um, Charles Williams. Uh, so, so there's lions in both, so perhaps there's a relationship. That's identifying similarity, assuming that there's some kind of resonance or imitation. 
But what if instead of looking at that, of looking at imitation or similarity, looking for things that are the same, what if instead we looked for change? So what if we knew that Tolkien was working in a, in a particular direction as he began The Lord of the Rings, looking in fact to write a book very much like his book, The Hobbit. In fact, he called The Lord of the Rings The New Hobbit. That was the working title of it when he started. Then he has lunch with C.S. Lewis and a comment that Lewis makes changes the direction, the trajectory of that entire book makes it more serious, shifts the genre from being a children's uh, tale to being a, an epic uh, that takes on a life of its own and is dealing with much more serious and substantial issues. So in searching for influence, I am proposing that if we look at the entire um, catalog of interactions among the members of the group and we look for evidence of this kind of change of direction or change of text then all of a sudden what is revealed to us is five different forms of interaction that result in new directions in new discoveries in changed manuscripts these by chapter here uh, in the company they keep our resonators, opponents, editors, collaborators, and reference. I want to talk briefly about each of these five different uh, kinds of interaction, means of influence, and talk about what we learn about the, uh, the inklings by looking not just at similarity or imitation, not just at finished manuscripts, but by looking at the full range of their interaction. So let's start with resonators. A resonator is defined as someone who fundamentally understands what you are attempting. So a resonator is someone who sees, here I am in the process. I'm trying to head this way. The resonator doesn't impose their own vision of that, but says, ah, I see where you go, you're going. I see what you're attempting. And I am committed to be there and support you through the steps of that entire process. In my chapter on resonators, I talk about praise, praise for the work. I talk about encouragement, encouragement for the writer. I talk about the importance of pressure, simply putting a little pressure, leaning on one another to uh, help that person actually buckle down and get the work done. I think about the value of role modeling, that is inviting other people into our own creative process so that they can learn from our example those things that worked for us. I think about how valuable it is more and more within the scholarship that we do to think in terms of an apprenticeship model. How can we help newer scholars in the field to accomplish their dreams and to achieve their goals by helping them to see not just what we have accomplished, but by seeing how we've gone about the work that we've done. I also think about things like anticipation. Anticipation is my preferred word, anticipation or expectation rather than accountability. I think that we all need a little bit of accountability but that's a nasty word that has such negative connotations. I like the idea that we stand on tiptoe in eager expectation for the kinds of things that one another will accomplish. Um, that expectation, having a listening ear, having someone who cares about what we're doing can be the one factor that makes all the difference. One of my favorite examples, probably the most important uh, example of a resonator among the inklings is Tolkien's work on the Lord of the Rings. It took him nearly 15 years to write that book and at several points in the process we know from his letters he gave up. He gave up. He totally quit. He said I'm done with this. I have worked on this. This isn't going anywhere. I don't know what to do next. I didn't want to do this in the first place. All of those things that assault any of us who are involved in any kind of long-term project. Tolkien had had it with the Lord of the Rings, but the Inklings believed in it. C.S. Lewis in particular wouldn't let it go. They wouldn't let him 
quit. They egged him on. They provoked him. Uh, they encouraged him. They, um, uh, in so many different ways, are actually responsible for the completion of that work. So unlike the work of scholars who said that they, there was no influence or that they were unable to affect it in any way, we have to take into account the incredible importance of resonators and the fact that because of these companions, Tolkien had the stamina he needed to complete this great and epic work. Let's talk about the second category that I uh, discovered or uncovered with this inside view, and that's the idea of opponents. Now, we don't think about wanting opponents. Uh, we don't think about seeking opponents. But honestly, we need opponents. We need someone who will challenge us in such a way that it will bring out the best in us. We think about iron sharpening iron. We think about the importance on those Tuesdays uh, at the Eagle and Child pub of the intellectual debate that undergirded the work that they were doing. Those opportunities to argue and refine their thoughts and not only to refine their understanding, but also to refine their ability to express themselves. Think about how many times when you've been working on maybe a piece of writing and it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere and you start talking with someone and in the process of talking and prompting and questioning all of a sudden you find not just a good way to say it but the best way the clearest way to get that uh, message across to an audience that's the importance of the opponents but another thing that an opponent can do is actually come against us and prevent us from dead ends. And that too is a gift for someone to be able to say, this isn't working, this isn't going anywhere. I know you're excited about this, I love that, but this particular work isn't doing the job that you think it is. And in that light, I think about the profound impact of the Inklings as a group on Charles Williams. Now, Charles Williams wrote a series of what are called supernatural thrillers, unusual novels that have a supernatural element. Technically, they're sort of murder mysteries in a way, and yet the mystery is big and it is profound, and there's always a, super el a supernatural element where the veil between the natural and supernatural worlds become thin. And uh, these two aspects of reality intersect one another in profound and amazing and interesting and challenging ways. Well, Charles Williams was working on a novel he called The Noises That Weren't There. I think from the title, it might have been a hint that he wasn't headed in the right direction. But in any case, he wrote three chapters of this novel the noises that weren't there. And he read those chapters to the Inklings. And universally, everybody in the room said, Charles, this is no good. What was the, the problem? They were able to identify that rather than a narrative, a, a story that focused on characters and plot, events unfolding, the beginning of this novel was basically a kind of exposition of ideas. It was explanatory material which belongs in an essay, but wasn't really working for the story that Williams was trying to tell. You, you've seen this sort of thing, characters who have large um, narrative dialogue. Uh, I'm sorry, they have <laughs> characters who have large chunks of dialogue and they just sort of drop them on each other. It doesn't feel like a conversation at all. Well, Charles Williams didn't like the advice of the Inklings. And so he read the work aloud to his wife and she agreed that the book was not promising uh, and he really needed to abandon it. After a little bit of resistance, he rethought it, started again, wrote three new chapters that incorporated some of the same characters, some aspects of the setting, even some of the same fundamental concepts, but the concepts were revealed through action, through real sounding dialogue, through actual events. And that novel became All Hallows Eve, the book that many people consider to be Charles Williams' finest work. A third category of interaction among the Inklings is editors, where opponents try to actually uh, combat 
or deny the value of something or redirect the author altogether. An editor makes specific comments giving specific advice and specific recommendations that can change the work. Now, some of these can be big and some of them can be very, very small. A word choice, a reference, an image that simply needs to be uh, cleaned up, corrected. It's interesting to look, for example, at the way that the Inklings uh, criticized C.S. Lewis's novel, Out of the Silent Planet. They accused him of a number of inconsistencies and problems in that, which Lewis addressed by having a kind of ending or epilogue uh, to that particular book. Editors can change the tone, the direction, the genre, they can correct errors, they can improve style, and in some cases, uh, as in, with, in some cases, as with the Inklings, editors can actually rewrite sections. It is interesting to see the extent to which they actually offered rewrites of one another's work, particularly their poetry. One very small editorial change that we see that's a result of the Inklings functioning as editors comes from Owen Barfield, one of the uh, long-term members of the group. Owen Barfield didn't live near uh, the Inklings and so he was able to come up from London only on occasion, but he's considered still a core member of that group because his thinking is so fundamental to what the Inklings did and what the Inklings accomplished. Well, Owen Barfield was a solicitor, a lawyer uh, by trade, and when he heard uh, the manuscript of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and he shared that with his wife, Maud, they both came to a conclusion that this was a dangerous book, that if children were to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, no doubt they would be entering into wardrobes in their homes, closing the door behind them, getting locked in, and that Lewis would face lawsuits as a result. And so Owen said, you need to include a warning in this book that children should not lock themselves in wardrobes. And if you look carefully at the text, you'll see several places in the text of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where C.S. Lewis warns children not to close the door behind them if they should happen to enter a wardrobe, whether that wardrobe is magical or not. A fourth uh, category of this interactive look uh, at the Inklings is how they functioned as collaborators. Uh, this particular function is sometimes what I call collaboration proper. I think of all of these categories, honestly, as being collaborative, working together to change the nature of a work, working together even to see that a work comes to fulfillment, to fruition. Uh, I think that those are collaborative acts, but when I'm talking about collaborators here, I'm talking about what we think of as collaboration proper, that is conceiving of a project together and then working together to see that to its conclusion. For the Inklings, we see evidence of joint scholarship, for example. We see several essay collections. We see also some collective action where the Inklings take their power as a group and try to bring about changes within the Oxford community that they're part of. When I think about collaboration proper, there's one aspect that is common among the Inklings that I think deserves special mention. And that's their tendency as they met together, as they worked together, as they hung out together to create collaborative poetry. I think this is incredibly important because it demonstrates just how interwoven their creative process was. Collaborative poetry, someone would throw out a line, someone would write the next line that rhymes and so on and so on through the steps of a poem that they would create on the fly. Perhaps it was a, a poem that would describe an experience that was going on. Perhaps it was a poem that would be a critique of something that they saw or had been reading. But as they conversed, they would write poetry and they would write it in alternating lines, sharing the creative process in a circle among them. And that was very, very typical 
of the way that uh, creative work simply emerged from the time that they were together. When you look at the Inklings, there are a lot of different examples of collaborative projects. Uh, two of them I would like to particularly highlight for you because I think that they help us to understand, again, how much collaboration was part of their thinking uh, in terms of their entire collaborative lives. So C.S. Lewis and Warren Hamilton Lewis began collaborating when they were still children. There was never a time in C.S. Lewis's life when he wasn't a collaborator. And uh, as a child, he and his brother Warren Lewis created imaginary worlds. C.S. Lewis uh, created a world he called Animal Land, talking animals in, in uh, clothes, uh, very political in its orientation. Warren Lewis wrote about uh, an in, uh, imaginary land he called India. And then these two worlds were mapped out, tied together in a larger created world called Boxen. The brothers worked on this for years and they drew maps, told stories, wrote poetry, wrote plays, created a newsletter for the people of Boxen. Uh, it was a very intricate, uh, elaborated, imagined world. As you're studying Lewis, I hope that you'll take a look at this early work. It's not much like some of his later work in many significant ways. However, uh, there is a vitality here and a creativity here that I think is a really important window into Lewis's creative life. In a similar way, as Tolkien was working on Middle Earth, particularly the stories that predate the Lord of the, the Rings, the first age, uh, he was very involved in the creative process alongside his son, Christopher Tolkien, an incredible scholar, a member of the Inklings, and someone to whom we are profoundly grateful for the way that he impacted and preserved his father's work. As Tolkien was working on The Lord of the Rings, he would often come to places where he was uncertain about the story. As the fellowship was moving through the journey, the epic journey uh, of the War of the Rings, Tolkien would often say, I'm not sure what the next set of events are. And so he would ask his son Christopher to draw a map of the geography and the terrain of the next section of the journey that these, uh, that the fellowship or members of the fellowship would be encountering. And by examining the map, by looking at the terrain, by benefiting from the work that Christopher had produced, Tolkien would have one of those aha moments where he would understand this is what needs to happen to the narrative if this is the land that they are moving through next. Well, the most profound, um, collaborative work that the Inklings produced was an essay collection called Essays Presented to Charles Williams. As the war was coming to an end and it seemed that Charles Williams would be returning to his home in London after a temporary stay among them in Oxford, the Inklings decided to put together a tribute volume, a fest shrift in honor of Charles Williams, something to put an end parentheses to his time among them, something to wish him bon voyage as he returned to his home in London. Unfortunately, Charles Williams died very suddenly and unexpectedly before the volume was completed and before he was able to return to his home and his family. These essays were still collected and published not as a tribute volume, but as a memorial volume in honor of Charles Williams. And the Inklings worked on it together as collaborators from start to finish. The final category I'd like to talk about is a category called reference. And um, this is a topic that deserves a book in its own and maybe someone will put that together someday, an anthology of all of the wonderful places where the Inklings actually write about one another. They cite one another's works. The Inklings show up in footnotes all over each other's books. They show up on dedication pages and, of course, on acknowledgement pages as well. 
They write poems about each other. They write poems together about joint experiences that they're having. And they also include each other as characters in each other's stories. For example, uh, it is assumed that uh, the characteristic way that Treebeard um, fusses over things, thinks things over, talks uh, at great length, and has a particular, peculiar hrum, hrum way of, uh, of talking that uh, Tolkien is using Lewis as the model for that character. Uh, on the other hand, when Lewis is writing Out of the Silent Planet, there's no question in my mind that Ransom, as he is originally conceived, as a linguist, a philologist who gets lost and kidnapped and taken off to another planet, uh, that Ransom at the beginning of that novel is based on Tolkien. Owen Barfield writes a, a very unusual, very strange uh, short story in which Jack appears as a character, uh, the main character of that particular science fiction, that story by Owen Barfield. Looking at those five categories, I hope that you can uh, see from an inside view how profoundly influential the Inklings were as they worked together on the process of these creative works. As we look at what they said to one another, we see that it made a tremendous uh, difference at the work that they were doing. As we shift to this study of what we are looking at and what we are looking for, and as we gain clarity on that subject, I think that the um, these things come clear, these things come into focus for us, and we get a different perspective of these authors and their work. But there's a third question that arises for me, and, and perhaps it is the most important question of all, and that's the question, how can the example of the Inklings, how can this uh, lively and committed interaction inform my work? How can it inform your work? Your work as a scholar, your work as an author, a teacher, a student, a speaker, your work as a pastor, an artist, a musician, a parent, a priest, an entrepreneur, your role as a friend. Uh, I, I think that is um, perhaps um, the most important question that we can ask, the takeaway from this study is how do we refuse to give in to what I call the bandersnatch impulse, the impulse to keep things to ourselves, protect our drafts, commit to going it alone, to be reluctant to involve others until we're really confident that our work is what it needs to be. How can we train our own resistance to involving others in all aspects of our creative process? How can we learn to be better even within this inaugural class, even within the classroom as you interact? How can we be better as resonators, opponents, editors, collaborators, and even reference in each other's work? How can we be alert to this? And how can we cultivate in this inaugural class a community that is characterized by a willingness to sacrificially invest ourselves in one another's highest good? Well, the bottom line, the conclusion that I draw from this study of the Inklings is this. I am in fact persuaded that writers do not create text out of thin air in a fit of personal inspiration. I honestly believe that the most common and natural expressions of creativity, of creativity in any form, in any genre, occur as part of an ongoing dialogue between writers, readers, texts, and contexts. 
I am persuaded that this truth is exemplified by weekly meetings of the inklings. It is manifest in their relationships with family, friends, colleagues, and acquaintances. Because like filaments joined together in a web, writers work as members of larger communities, like the community that you are now part of. As we work, we influence and are influenced by the company we keep. Thank you so much for joining me uh, for this time and for this talk. I'm very, very grateful for your time here and I wish you well as you continue, continue to bless and strengthen, help, support, encourage, challenge one another in all of the ways that really brings out the best in each of us. Thank you so very much. Take care.